Okay, this is a uh, worked example of a past paper question for students studying uh, the aerodynamics course on the College Cambria Airbus Apprenticeship Program. Um, so I promised I'd do a past paper style question for you as a worked example. Um, obviously, this is the first year we're running this course. So there aren't actually any past papers for this particular course. So I've chosen a course that is taught has been running for many years at Swansea University, uh, which is our year two aerodynamics course, because this contains some similar content to the content on your um, your Airbus uh, aerodynamics course. So this is the exam from uh, 2015. And uh, the setup of this exam will be similar to the setup of your exam. There'll be four questions. You'll have two hours in order to answer three of those questions. And you can choose which of those three questions uh, you go for. Uh, you'll be given a formula sheet. It'll be slightly different to the one here, but the formula sheet will contain all of the equations and relationships, definitions that you need in order to complete the exam. Um, so this is what the formula sheet looks like for this particular course. Yours will look slightly different to this, but there will be things here that you will be familiar with. For example, the lifting line theory content. Um, and in particular, what we're going to need for the case, that, uh, the example we're going to do today is this content here on potential flow. So we're going to come back to this. And I'm going to do a little bit of skipping back and forth between the, the formula sheet, the question, and uh, where I'm going to write the solution. So I'm going to skip question one and move straight on to look at question two from this paper. And this would be similar to the kind of question you might expect uh, on the College Cambria aerodynamics course. This is a nice question because it combines two different aspects uh, of the course um, that we've looked at. One, one it looks at uh, dimensional analysis and the power of, uh, of using that as a tool to understand, um, I guess, the, the, the basis of uh, different parameters in a problem. Um, uh, but the main focus of this is potential flow theory or idealized flows as we've been referring to it. So let's have a look at this question. Let's read through the start of it and make sure we understand what this is about. So question two says, the flow around a rotating cylinder of radius r is one of the classic problems in aerodynamics. Okay. Potential flow theory can be used to describe the velocity and pressure field around the cylinder. So straight away, without reading on, we know this is a problem about potential flow theory. So you might want to remind yourselves about things like how you write down flow fields using the potential stream function approach of idealized flows. Um, remember there are these four different types of flows that you can add together to find solutions. There was um, uniform flow, vortex flow, um, source or sink, and a doublet. Um, those are the four different types of flows that we tend to patch together to solve problems in potential using the potential flow approach. Um, and this is a flow around a cylinder. Hopefully one of the things you remember from recent lectures is that you can represent flow around a cylinder by combining a uniform free stream and a doublet. And that will give you some representation of flow around a cylinder. But this is a rotating cylinder. And the implication here is that the rotation of the cylinder is what's inducing vorticity into the problem. So part A says, and this is, you know, we look, this is only worth two marks, so presumably this is a fairly straightforward thing to do. Uh, it says, define the velocity potential phi for the flow around a rotating cylinder. So uh, let's make a note of what we're doing here. So this is EG 293, which is a Swansea University course in aerodynamics. And this is the 2015 summer exam. We're going to look at question two. And the problem that we have is we've got Cylinder, it's the best cylinder I can draw on this tablet system. It's of radius capital R. And there's some free stream flow over this. Uh, we'll call that U infinity. Um, unless 
just check does the question specify the infinity in fact is what to look at later on uh, later on in the problem it says that the flow field is v infinity so i'm going to just to get consistent terminology let's change that to v infinity um, and there is vorticity now i've already had a go at this problem so i know from the signs that are used and the and the forces that we need to get out later on um, that actually the vorticity is going to turn out to be in this direction so I'm going to just start off by drawing it in this direction because I already know the solution you didn't you wouldn't have to do this you just have to be careful with the sign convention as we go which should become obvious so there's some sort of vorticity field um, represented by the fact that or the, or the fact that the cylinder uh, is rotating introduces this vorticity field um, so we could just write this straight down, but just to be clear what we're doing, I'm going to, I'm going to write that flow around a cylinder can be represented by a uniform stream. And the doublet, the rotation, and the represented by a vortex. Okay, so the implication of this, and let's state getting these results from the formula sheet. At this point, just flick back to that formula sheet and scroll up to the relevant table, which is here. So we're going to combine, and it's the potential flow, not the stream function solution. Remember, this is the potential, the velocity potential. This is the stream function. Um, and the definitions of these things uh, are provided here. So this is... Uh, the definition of the velocity potential in terms of polar and Cartesian coordinates and the stream function in terms of uh, polar and Cartesian coordinates, which we'll come on to later. So we're going to combine the uniform flow, a doublet, that will give us the flow on the cylinder, and then we're going to add in a vortex. We're just going to add in this, this, and this term here to get something that looks like this so this flow phi is going to be equal to the infinity x, which is our um, uniform stream, plus a as theta over r, which is a polar coordinate minus capital gamma theta over two pi, which is our vortex. Now it doesn't explicitly say that we need to write this potential function down in any particular coordinate system. Obviously here now we've got a combination of Cartesian coordinates with the x and polar coordinates with the r and theta. So it might just make it a bit tidy. It might be worth converting this in all into polar coordinates so that we're consistent. We can write phi and explicitly state here that this is now in polar coordinates r and theta, which will require us to convert x, the Cartesian coordinate system, into polar coordinates. But that's easy enough to do because x is just r cos theta plus a cos theta over r minus gamma theta over 2 pi. Again, it doesn't explicitly ask us to do this, uh, but just to be absolutely clear, I'm going to explain what each of these is in my answer. I'm going to say that this is the uniform flow. This is the doublet. And this is the vortex. And that will get you all your marks. In fact, just writing down the correct solution, even if it was just in this form, would get you the full marks there. So let's go back to the question. And
part two is about dimension, dimensional analysis. It says, give the dimension of the velocity potential using fundamental dimensions. Um, because remember, your fundamental dimensions are mass, length, time, and if necessary, temperature. Those are the four fundamental dimensions that we've been working with. Um, we haven't explicitly talked about what the dimensions of this potential function are. But if you ever are asked to work out the dimensions of a quantity that you're unsure of, the easy way to do that is just think of any equation or definition formula that's got that in it with other parameters for which you know the dimensions and from that you can quickly work out um, what the dimensions of your, your unknown quantity are. So we can do this here, so we know that one of the definitions, or I guess the fundamental definition in, in polar coordinates uh, of potential function is that u r, the radial component of the velocity field, is given by d phi by dr. That's, again, that's on the formula sheet, if you don't remember that. Now, the implication of this is, if we were to rearrange this, the dimensions of phi must be equal to the dimensions of u r multiplied by the dimensions of r. u r is just a velocity. So the dimensions of velocity are um, L over T, L T T minus one. And the dimension of R is just the distance, that's L. So the dimensions of phi must be L squared over T. Pretty simple. Nice easy two marks there. Just, just thinking about that, obviously, it's not obvious, it wouldn't be obvious that, that those were the dimensions of the potential function, L squared over T, so in SI units that would be meter squared per second. Again, physically, the, the physical meaning of that is not obvious, but that's that's how it works out, um, and the dimensional analysis doesn't lie, so, so that's uh, what you get for the dimensions of the potential function. Uh, Part C, now this is worth three marks. Draw an image of the streamlines if the circulation, which is a measure of the vortex strength, is set to zero. So we've got no vortex present. And it also says include the non-physical streamlines inside the cylinder. And remember that, that this idealized flow approach is is a, just gives you some representation or a flow field that in some way represents reality. Um, it's not the true flow field. If you actually solve these flow fields, you end up with streamlines inside the body of interest. Um, but the definition of the boundary of the body is that it is a streamline itself. Um, so let's go back and think about what this must look like in the case where there's no vorticity. Well. In the far field, we're going to have uniform flow. So maybe a good starting point would be to write, okay, so this, is, this is the incoming streamlines here. And at a large distance downstream, you must have exactly the same thing. The question is, what happens in between? We know that in the middle here there is a cylinder, a radius r, and if there's no vorticity, then the flow will be symmetric. It means that the upper surface and the lower surface, what happens above and below this cylinder, uh, will be symmetric. The surface of the cylinder is a streamline, so effectively the streamline is getting split over the top and bottom surface and then rejoining at a stagnation point. Um, this position here, at the back of the cylinder, and then the streamline will just get symmetrically pushed up and over here. This is not going particularly well, but I'm going to 
actually in fact I'm doing this on a tablet rather than on a piece of paper. And one of the things we noticed when we did this in class or similar problems to this in class was that the streamlines bunch up on the top and bottom, they get pressed close together and where streamlines are being pushed together that indicates that the flow is being accelerated. So over the top and the bottom of this cylinder we can infer from this streamline pattern that the, the flow is being accelerated. Um, but it also says to include these kind of non-physical streamlines that exist in the solution of the potential function inside the cylinder. And remember a doublet is the combination of a source and a sink effectively positioned on top of each other. So at the same point you're simultaneously pushing flow out to create this shape and sucking flow in. Which basically means you're going to have flow field inside that looks something like this. Okay, so I'd be expecting the final of the three marks of this problem to uh, to show that flow field inside the cylinder as well. So I guess the three marks would be looking for the fact that you recognize that you have a uniform flow field upstream and downstream for one mark the fact that the flow is symmetric above and below when, when the vorticity is zero and some representation that looks sensible of the flow field inside the cylinder itself. So that's part C. Part D. Derive equations that describe the velocity field for a rotating cylinder in terms of the polar coordinates R and theta if the strength of the doublet, which is by this K or kappa, is V infinity R squared. So, how do we do this? Let's just make a note so we don't forget that we've been told that k or kappa is b infinity r squared. That's probably been chosen to make our life easier later on. Well, all we need to work out the we uh, were asked for the velocity field, I believe. Um, yeah, describe the velocity field in terms of polar coordinates. So we just need to remember or look up in the formula sheet, this will be available in the formula sheet, that, that UR, the radial component of the velocity field in polar coordinates, is just the derivative of phi with respect to R. We go back, remind ourselves what phi looks like in polar coordinates. It's this, we just need to take the derivative of this thing here with respect to R. And if we do that, we're going to get the infinity cos theta minus a cos theta all over r squared. And we can substitute into k and we can get v infinity cos theta minus v infinity r squared cos theta all over r squared. Definition of u theta, the tangential or the, the, uh, the, the theta wise component, um, the word expression, um, of the velocity field in polar coordinates is 1 over r times d phi by d theta. Again, that's just on the formula sheet, so you need to take that potential function in r theta polar coordinates. Take the derivative of it with respect to theta, which is easy to do, and then divide the two by r. And if you do that, we're going to end up with minus v infinity sine theta minus k sine theta over r squared minus gamma over 2 pi r. If we substitute in for k, we get minus v infinity sine theta minus v infinity r squared sine theta over r squared minus over 2 pi r. And that's part D. Basically, can you differentiate? Part E, derive an expression for the pressure coefficient in the case where the circulation gamma is zero. Draw a graph showing the pressure coefficient on the surface of the cylinder as a function of polar coordinate theta. And then work out what the maximum and minima of that 
pressure coefficient r and where they exist uh, on that graph with respect to theta. Probably, so this is probably the trippiest bit of the problem. Um, first thing we need to make, uh, realize is that in this case the circulation of the vortex strength is set to zero. And on the surface of the cylinder, this is where we're interested in plotting CP, the velocity is just the, the theta coordinate, the theta component of the velocity field because there is no perpendicular velocity, there's no radial component of velocity TPO on that surface. Um, and that the value of R equals R on that surface. So let's just make sure I'm clear about that. So we're interested in the CP value on this surface here. Well, on that surface, R equals big R. Because this is a streamline, the UR component is equal to zero. There is no flow in that perpendicular direction. All the flow is in this tangential direction. So the entire velocity field is U theta. So the question is, what is U theta when R is equal to big R? So that would give you the velocity field. And from that, we can use Bernoulli to work out what the pressure distribution would be. So, so the velocity, the function of theta, is simply going to be u theta as a function of theta. Let's make clear this is on the cylinder surface. So I'm going to substitute into this expression that we derive for u theta, which is this one here. set little r to be equal to big R, and that's of course, you quickly spot why k in this case was, we were told it would be infinity r squared because that allows things to cancel out and makes our life easier. Um, and we're going to end up with minus v infinity sine theta minus, and then because the r squared is going to cancel minus b infinity sine theta, of course the vortex term disappears, so we end up with minus 2 b infinity sine theta. What we're interested in is the pressure distribution, and we get that using Bernoulli, which states that p infinity plus r rho infinity, the infinity squared in the free stream, so the static pressure plus the dynamic pressure will be the same along a streamline in this flow field. It will be P plus a half. Of course, in idealized flows, we assume that the flow is incompressible, so rho, in rho stays the same and is equal to the rho infinity value. And on the surface of the cylinder, we now know that the velocity distribution with theta looks like this. I just substituted that into uh, the at the point we're interested in working out the pressure p. Now we need to remember what the definition of cp is, the pressure coefficient, and this is p minus p infinity, so it's the deviation of pressure from the pressure infinity, normalized by dynamic pressure in the free stream, which is this. We can work this out from this expression up here. We're going to have p minus p infinity. So I bring the p infinity here onto the right hand side, take all of this over onto the left hand side, cancel through by a half row v squared. I'm going to put a little bit of rearranging, I'm going to end up with 1 minus 4 sine squared theta. question is, what does that look like as I traverse around uh, around this cylinder from zero from uh, theta equals zero at the leading edge all around theta equals pi on the trailing edge and because there's no circulation the flow field is symmetric in this case as we sketched it earlier 
which means that the pressure distribution is going to be the same on the top and the bottom. So you don't need to worry about this. This is Cp, um, theta is zero here. So it's pi here, the trading edge at the top and bottom, pi by two. So what does this thing look like? Well, when theta is zero, sine of theta, therefore sine squared of theta is zero. Similarly, when, when theta is pi, sine of pi is zero, so sine squared of pi is zero. So we're just going to have Cp equals 1 at this point and 1 at this point. When sine theta is pi by 2, so sine theta pi by, sine of pi by 2 is uh, 1. So when this thing is 1, sine squared is, sine squared of pi by 2 is 1, so 1 minus 4 is minus 3, so we're going to go down to minus 3. The minimum point. So you're going to end up with something that looks like okay, particularly well, another, something that looks like that. So we're going to have a point, points of maximum pressure at the leading edge and the trailing edge of the cylinder, point of minimum pressure at the top and bottom in the middle where the CP drops down to minus minus C. So we were asked to explicitly state that. So max. CP equals 1, mean CP equals minus 3. Okay, so we're nearly there now. That was a big part of the question, six marks available for this. So for a certain level, so we're introducing circulation in. Interesting to point out, actually, is with no circulation, you get symmetric pressure distribution top and bottom, which means the pressure fields will cancel out, there'll be no lift. But also it's symmetric front to rear. We've got a maximum pressure of one at the back, one at the front, which means there's no drag either. So this is the famous D'Alembert paradox of 2D idealized flow fields. So in this final part, perhaps predictably, we're asked to think about the situation where there now is um get back to it. So for it says for part F. For a certain level of circulation, the stagnation points can be found at theta equals pi by 4 and theta equals 3 pi by 4, which is the value of rho infinity, v infinity, and r. And it says calculate the lift for this uh, rotating cylinder. Calculate the lift generated by this rotating cylinder. So. Part F. So we've got stagnation points at theta equals minus pi by 4 and theta equals minus 3 pi by 4, which must be on the bottom of the cylinder. At stagnation points, the flow has come to rest. Okay. So on the surface, we know that the velocity field is just given by u theta, so u theta must be equal to zero. Remember, on the surface, r is equal to big R. And the implication of this, u theta, just going back to that expression we derived earlier, which is minus 2 v infinity sine theta, but we've now got a non zero vortex component, which is this part here, over 2. R, all of this must be equal to zero. And we can set this to big R. If we rearrange that, we're going to get that gamma is equal to minus 4 pi big R d infinity sine theta. We need to use just one of these values, sine so we know that this is true at theta equals minus pi by 4. We've been given the values of r and v infinity, so we can work out what circulation gamma is. And this is going to be minus 4 pi times r, which is 3, times v infinity, which is 2, times sine of minus pi by 4. The circulation is given by minus 53.3 in this case. Now the little trick is just to remember that for any body in this idealized flow approximation, 
the Kata Joukowsky theorem. This will be on the formula sheet is given by L is equal to rho infinity, V infinity, and the circulation around that body. We know rho infinity, we know V infinity, we now know the circulation values, so we can work out the list. And if we plug those numbers in, we get rho infinity is 1, V infinity is 2, circulation is minus 53.3, so we've got a value of minus 106.6. Newtons. It's negative, which implies that it's a downforce. Okay. So part G then says, now draw the streamlines when the stagnation points are found at those positions. Theta equals minus pi by 4, and theta equals minus 3 pi by 4. Show the direction of the velocity on these streamlines. So this is part G. The cylinder just so n so minus pi by four six around about this point here. Right there is theta equals minus pi by four. So this is a stagnation point, and three pi by four sits somewhere like this. So this is the leading stagnation point. This is the trailing stagnation point. We're generating downforce in this case. So we should have a flow field that's going to end up looking something like this. And we know that this is the rear stagnation point. So we're going to have that line going off back to the free stream at infinity, and then these three lines presumably do something like this. So there it is. That's um, kind of what you'd be expected to do in one exam style question. I mean, that's taken me about 30 minutes to do with lots and lots of explanation. Um, if you weren't doing all the talking and the, you know, the additional explanations that I was doing, I would like to think you could do that in under 30 minutes. Um, in the exam, you'll have two hours in order to do three questions like that.